Okay, hello everyone. My name is uh, Jörn Lys again, and I've been asked to speak about social entrepreneurship. I call my presentation from a two-man startup in Oslo to Silicon Valley and the big world because I believe social entrepreneurship, you know, is the same as entrepreneurship. So I wanted to tell this entrepreneurial story behind my company and why it then venture into social media. So Meltware is the global leader in online news and social media analytics. We started in Norway with a very humble beginning. We are now grown to a global business headquartered in San Francisco with more than 1,000 employees. We have more than 23,000 corporate clients. We have more than 50 offices across the world. And the company was built without venture funding. The company was bootstrapped, and it was built on $15,000 without external capital and debt. Fundamentally, what the company is, is a big data company. We process more than 100 million documents every day. And every day, we also do more than 2 trillion searches. And we analyze online news, social media, and it starts with data capture. Then we move on to data enrichment, natural language processing, and those kind of technologies. And then we also do have a proprietary search engine and we also do real-time analytics. So these are some other examples of the clients that we have. So we have everyone from Apple, Google, Harvard University, Manchester United, and even the Pope in Rome is a client of Meltwater, which we are very proud of. But I will tell you the story of Meltwater. We started in 2001, how we then expanded across the world, and how we moved into Ghana. So we started in Norway with humble beginnings. We were two guys in a coffee machine, and the starting capital was $15,000. So the computers that you see in the background are actually used computers that I got from a former client of mine. So very humble beginnings, and the surroundings was very different than the very fancy place that I've seen in my visit here to Korea. I've been to Mari 180, I went to the Google campus, Dcamp, and so on. And we started in a very much less um, prestigious surroundings. So after being successful in Norway, we moved to Sweden. And the way we expanded to Sweden was hiring really, really top Swedish recent university graduates. We brought them to Oslo, trained them there for three months, and then sent them back to Sweden with adult supervision. And this company, or this office in Sweden, was actually very, very successful and turned out to be cash flow positive after 14 days. The challenge in London was much bigger. So we realized after coming to the UK that the British market is very different. The Brits are in many ways a different species. They speak differently, they have different expectations, they wear in pink shirts, they are all in all very, very different. So after a lot of struggle, initially, we finally were able to make it. And the person that was able to make our Meltwater expansion into the UK market was Paul Larson, which you see at the back um, of this picture. And from UK, we were able to develop managers. And we were able to ma develop managers across the world. So from the London office, we were able to expand to Dubai, South Africa, uh, Hong Kong, as well as Australia. Germany was the toughest market we entered. That was two years of humiliation. It was so challenging, and it's by far the most challenging market I ever entered. In 2006, we expanded to the US because our aspiration was to become a global business. And in order to become a global business, the US market, of course, is very, very important. And I'm from Norway, and we used to say back in the days that, you know, the, no, there are bus stops outside of New York that has a larger economy than what we have in Norway. And that's why we have to go to the US. So we were four guys that sold everything we owned in Scandinavia, cars, boats, house, and everything, and packed our stuff in two suitcases and landed in Silicon Valley. And I don't know how many of you have been to Silicon Valley, but we landed at the San Francisco airport, and for the first couple of days, we were driving up and down 101, and we couldn't find Silicon Valley because in our naivety, we thought Silicon Valley was high-rise buildings and uh, high-tech, 
but all what we found was sleepy uh, suburbs. But that turned out actually to be Silicon Valley. And uh, Silicon Valley turned out to be very, very good for us. And we, although we struggled initially, it turns out that US is very receptive. So I will encourage all you guys to, to when you expand, go to the US. Americans are very solution-oriented. Orient, if you can present something that makes their job easier, they're very positive to that. And the US operation were also helping us to expand across the world. So we expanded to Hong Kong. Um, this is a Norwegian girl. She was a single mom at the time, but she was the right person we felt to go to Asia together with Chris that had been trained in the London office. So Miriam was a single mom, and in order to make it work, we hired a full-time nanny and sent her to Hong Kong together with her. And that turned out to be very, very successful. So from Hong Kong, we also expanded to Tokyo, Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and New Delhi. And Asia is one of our fastest growing markets right now. And I've been traveling throughout the world because of uh, Mel Fodder. And I have to say one of the things that I really love is realizing how similar people are, really are. And everyone says that when you go out internationally and want to do business in different markets, you need to be very culturally aware. People are different. People do business different. But my biggest takeaway is that I'm more surprised at how similar people are than how different. Everywhere you go, people want to be successful, people want to learn, people want to grow, people want to develop, and make a uh, decent earning so they can take care of their family. So this is a picture I got in December 2010, and this is from the Maldives. And Melvore doesn't have an office in the Maldives, but uh, there were a couple of our colleagues from Singapore, they were home, and they were home for Christmas. And before they took celebration for Christmas, they sent a greeting to the rest of the company, wishing everyone happy holidays. And when I got this email, I kind of paused. And it was kind of a little moved, because this was the first time I really realized how global a business that Mulford actually has become. And this brings me to MEST and the school in Ghana. <clears throat> so based on the what I told you about Melford so far, I hope that you can see that we have developed a lot of uh, young talent in Melford. And that brought us to the conclusion to actually start a school for software entrepreneurs in Ghana. This is something we did. Um, we an made an announcement in January 2007, and we decided to start a school one year later, and February 2008, the school was up and running. And I guess the two common questions that I often receive, and that is, why would a company like Mel Melfoder create a school for software entrepreneurs in Africa? And the other question is, and why Africa? Why not other places? And I guess my response to the first question is that if you look at what Melfoder is as a company, you know, our core expertise is that we know how to build a software company. And we also focus a lot on nurturing young talent. That is fundamentally our core expertise. And for us to set up a school in Africa, although that sounds very remote, very crazy, is really channeling our core expertise in a non-profit context. And to the point of Africa, why Africa? I believe Africa is going to be very involved with software going forward. In Africa, there's so much talent. The population of Africa is a staggering billion people. And by the end of this century, expectations are that the population will grow to between three and four billion. And currently, a lot of people in Africa are unemployed. It doesn't matter how talented they are, but I believe in the future, software can have a big place in Africa's uh, development. The beautiful thing with software is that it only takes a computer for a few hundred bucks, and after that, it's up to anyone's talent, drive, and conviction to develop an aspiring business. That's how Google was developed, that was Facebook developed, 
That's how Microsoft developed. And you will see lots of large companies be generated that way. So I believe software will be a very important part of building Africa. So the program MEST is a philanthropic endeavor in three parts. It's a school, it's a two-year program where we train young, talented university graduates. And we teach them in how to code. We teach them how to develop software. And it's a fully sponsored program. We give them housing and uh, three meals a day. And we give them all the opportunity to really immerse themselves in the learning of software. In addition to that, we also teach them the basic of business ideas, go to market strategies, and understand the commercial potential of their talent. The second piece is that we also have a seed fund. Because the final examination of the two-year program is a 15-minute investment pitch. And what we do is that we fly in a real-world panel of angels. So for example, from Silicon Valley and other places. And if our graduates are able to convince the real-world panel, we provide seed funding, everything from fifty dollars to $200,000 in each company. And proceeds of these minority stakes will then be reinvested back into the nonprofit. And the third thing that we do is we also have an incubator. So we currently have an incubator with 15 startups in Africa. And these are startups that focus partly on global ideas, and some of them also focus on problems and ideas that are relevant for the African market. We also have a satellite in San Francisco so that uh, entrepreneurs from Africa can also go to San Francisco and engage with the San Francisco ecosystem if that should be needed. And of course, throughout this program, a big part of the program is related to mentorship. Lots and lots of training and mentorship. So this is a bridge created by some of the students from a previous class. And this is a bridge combining the school and the incubator. And top graduates are the ones that uh, receive specific funding and walk over the bridge to the incubator. I will finish with some examples of our entrepreneurs. Um, one of our entrepreneurs was Anne, and during recruitment, she was so shy. She was not able to give you any eye contact, and if you wanted to say or hear what she was saying, you had to really lean in, but even then, it was really hard to understand what she was saying. But her aptitude test was through the roof. It was one of the strongest aptitude tests that we have ever seen. So we decided, we need to bring this person on board. And through the program, she grew a lot. And she became accomplished CEO for a team that actually got funding. And in 2011, she got a passport for the first time, jumped on a plane, and was dropped in the madness of Silicon Valley, and was presenting in front of more than 1,000 people at the launch conference in Silicon Valley. And in front of 1,000 people, she was able to articulate her business idea. She was able to defend her business proposition and ended up winning the, best, the prize for the best business at launch that year. And since then, she has been representing Africa in a number of mentor programs that was organized by Fortune and the US State Department and really become a, a little bit of a local celebrity in Africa. Another one of entrepreneurs, Robert Lamptey, he was the first African entrepreneur to ever enter TechCrunch Disrupt. And he went all the way to the top in, in his year. And he was so nervous when he went, went out on stage, so he didn't know what to do, so he started to clap. <laughs> so before he uttered one word, the whole audience was clapping. And uh, then he presented a pitch, which basically was a messaging app that was not only on smartphones, but also on feature phones. And in the world at that time, there was more than 5 billion feature phones all in the world. And this company was later acquired by an Axel-based uh, company from US. A third entrepreneur is David Osei. He's the founder of Dropify. And Dropify has been uh, um, awarded into the 500 startup uh, accelerated in San Francisco. They won the Global Kaufman Foundation Prize in 2013. And uh, they basically won the Global Startup Open Competition. And they also was featured on CNN and uh, was the first 
Yeah, it was the first African startup that was ever admitted into both plug and play and 500 startups in San Francisco. Um, I think we just go straight to the um, movie. So can we have the movie? So we have a present, we have a feature from BBC coming to Ghana to, to give an, a report on our school. Could a homespun superhero from Africa one day take on the best of the West? There's no reason a local superhero from Africa wouldn't be as big as um, Spider-Man in the Western world. The Ghanaian video games developer Letty Arts draws on African history and culture to populate its mobile video games. Car yeah, so while we wait for the movie, I can go through some of the slides. I have some backup slides. So this is some photos uh, some, uh, from, from the school in Ghana. This is from the opening in 2008. Um, this is from the first day, and one of the things that we uh, teach uh, teaching at that time was culture. So a big part of the training is about culture, is about values and success principles. And the training is partly lectures and partly workshops. And a lot of the learning actually happens in teamwork. It actually happens in a project setting. So every month, you basically have an um, assignment that is due, and it's teamwork. And it's not necessarily so that you're taught everything that you need to, to need for solving the problem in class. A big part of it is basically that you learn the essentials so that you can figure out how to do it yourself after. So this is the first year of graduation. And I love this picture because they look so happy. And uh, here's another photo. This is two of the females that graduated in the program the first year. And we put a lot of focus on the females. And here's some of the females that we have come through the class. Um, there's the Anne that I mentioned uh, in, our, um, in, a, in my presentation earlier. And uh, what we learned is that some of the strongest members of the class are typical females. We try to bring in as much females as we can, and we have specific outreach programs for recruiting females. But we are excited that we are able to bring in so much females in the program. And here's a tweet from one of the faculty teachers that I really liked, and that uh, it reads, the proud ladies of MEST, CEOs and future entrepreneurs, they code, manage, and execute. Watch this space. So I thought that was very cute. Another company that was also featured in the BBC um, program that we hopefully will see afterwards was is Letty Art. And Letty Art is basically building cartoons and mobile games based on African folklore. And the founder of this company was actually invited to the White House by Obama last year, because Obama had a African Leadership Summit, where he invited more than 50 states leaders and a, and a bunch of successful African entrepreneurs. And we were really proud that one of those entrepreneurs actually came from our school. And when I'm in Ghana, you know, we go out and for dinners and so on. And the founder of this company, Let the, uh, uh, Aram, he said, when our company is profitable, I'll buy you dinner. So two years ago, he was invited to speak at the largest gaming conference uh, in San Francisco, the l largest gaming conference in the world, actually. And then he came and he brought us out uh, for have dinner. And it was a very proud moment for for him, but certainly also for me. So, we're, so he brought the team out, and he said, oh, please eat, please eat, please drink. So he was hosting us, all of us, and then he took out a big stack of dollars because he doesn't have credit cards, right? So paying for all of us and for this meal in San Francisco, and that was very, very sweet of him. So we, that was a proud moment. Okay, I think, hopefully we are back on the movie. Can we test out the movie again? Okay, so no, no movie? Okay. Okay, so uh, I guess 
I can finish off then and say that social, you hear about the term social entrepreneurship, you hear about entrepreneurship, but I believe that it's all the same. Entrepreneurship is in many ways uh, a way for people to express themselves. In the same way that a painter expresses themselves in making a painting, a composer creates music, I believe that entrepreneurs express themselves through building companies. I think most entrepreneurs have a vision to make the world in their little way a little better. Either it's a better product, it's a better solution, it's a better way to do things. And that's why I don't want to distinguish between entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. So MEST, Ghana, the school that uh, was developed in Africa, came from Meltwater's core values. We are passionate about people, we focus a lot on nurturing people, and fundamentally for us, it was really about developing, our, um, channel, channeling our core expertise into a non-profit arena. So on that note, I'll leave a couple of minutes for any questions, if there should be any. All right? Okay, very good. Thank you so much.